Welcome to the Real Estate Entrepreneurs Podcast. Welcome to the Real Estate Entrepreneurs Podcast. And today we have Mr. Real Virtual Fleet Land, my friend Ray Zhang, who's actually in China at the moment. And you know what's funny, Ray? I'm in Venezuela right now. So we're both <laughs> out of the US doing this podcast. That's crazy. How you doing, brother? Good. How are you, Ricardo? Good, man. I, um, I was not expecting you to be in China, so uh, that that's a, that's a surprise to me. And I'm in Venezuela, so I'm not known about us in the U.S., but guess what? We're streaming all over the U.S. right now. So um, for those of you, this is, this is a perfect example, Ray, of it doesn't matter where you are. Like, you don't have to be in the U.S. to do this. You could be in China or you could be in Venezuela like I am right now. You can literally do real estate from anywhere in the world. But let's talk about you, man. Like, tell us, tell me a little bit about yourself. Like, where do you come from? Uh, you know, what do you do in your past life? Those kind of things. Yeah, I'm from here, China, and uh, went to the U.S. about 12, 13 years ago. Okay. And uh, as a student, so I was uh, kind of lost because yeah, I didn't have enough uh, money to uh live by day uh, day by day so uh but after so many years finally i step into what i do right now and uh, i can make a make a good living i guess so tell me when you moved to china uh, from china to the u.s how old were you uh i was about 20 23. did you speak english at the time or or no english uh, I don't think you could understand me. <laughs> right. That's, yeah, but right now you maybe a little, right? So. Yeah, you you tried to speak English back then, right? And, and. Yeah, yeah. Everybody I I got hold of, they were like, "What the hell are you talk about?" You know, you know. But, and um, when you moved to the U.S., what what were some of the first jobs you ever had? Like, because you didn't come here starting investing in real estate right away, right? Yeah, I had a, a, you know, I went to outside to work for a yard and uh, cut the trees and uh, find out the, the saw is very heavy and uh, the owner saw me working slowly. I, I really did my best, but uh, he fired me anyways because I was very slow. Okay. Uh, that was my first job. Uh, second job, I was a janitor uh, cleaning floors. And oh, big, it begins there. And you were cleaning floors, what, at an office building, or what was it? Yeah, kind of like a museum. Uh, that's when I had a lot of time to listen to stuff, because nobody is around me. So I can do whatever I wanted. OK. And um, so how old are you today? Uh, I'm 36. 36. So we're talking about maybe 13 years ago is when you moved to America. Yeah. About thirty and, years ago, and you did you did landscaping, you did um, janitor, janitor. What else did you do? Uh, that's basically about it. After that, um, <clears throat> my income had a jump uh, because I was always listening to the positive audio tape, and uh, I was a car dealer after that, and uh, it's totally different lifestyle then how did you jump from being a janitor to a car dealer uh i guess a lot of time we see the you know a lot of time we get trapped into what should i do what can i do is this new thing something i should do we focus on the method instead of focusing on the mindset so if your mindset is right you can make everything work but if your mindset is not right, you know, the thing that you're trying to do might not work for you. So uh, I think I got my mindset right because I listened to this book, particularly I'm going to share over and over again. And then uh, I was mentally ready and then I started to do car flips. OK, what, what book was that? Uh, it's not Think and Go Rich. It's called uh, The Science of Getting Rich. The Science of Getting Rich. That's a great book. Yeah, yeah, yeah very good book. I was listening well, to it 
no less than 300 times. Wow. Yeah. How long is the book on the audio version? About two hours. Uh, I was listening about five times a day. For okay. A month. So you were obsessed with the book, basically. Basically, and, yeah. And you got to listen to it every day. You became a car dealer. Um, yeah. So I'm assuming that you were going to the auctions and buying cars and selling them and and and, and that kind of is that what you did sort of? Uh, I did it at the beginning, but uh, I found out it's not a good method because everyone is bidding, and uh, when there's a bidding war, people get emotional, so they pay a lot of money, right? So right. what I do is I reach out to the private seller, and uh, I just negotiate. So that's why in my land course right now. I put a huge emphasis on negotiation, so that skill was shaped by the, those so many years of uh, negotiating with the with the car car um, owners. Understood, and yeah. and um, so you never had a Chinese restaurant. No, no, well, <laughs> <Come on>, man. <laughs> so, um, you know, most yeah. of my friends are Chinese. They they either have a restaurant or something along those lines. You know, uh, and, yeah, um, it's so hard. hard. It, it's hard. It's hard, and it's the food business is not easy. People think it's easy, and it's not. Um, yeah. So, how do you go from? Do you still own the the, the car dealerships or not anymore? Uh, not anymore. No. What happened? So I moved from Hawaii. I originally went to Hawaii. So I moved from Hawaii to Florida. I made a decision to change, right? So I think the car sales days is gone. So right now I have to do real estate full time. Uh, okay. So I don't have, have that dealership anymore. Yeah. Right. So you didn't have an option, basically. When yeah. you when you left Hawaii, you kind of like burned all the ships. Yeah, you moved to Florida and... and, and um, so what did you start doing as soon as you moved to Florida? Uh, what made it? What made me to move? No, like what did you start doing? Like because you said you wanted to change your your environment. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it was hard. I was earning about fifty grand a month flipping cars. Okay. And uh, I made a decision to move to Florida to do land flipping full time because when I was uh, a car dealer, I was doing land as well, but not a lot of volume. So I decided to do that full time, and uh, you know it's from fifty thousand to zero, right? And then I have to think of a way to make money. But luckily enough, um, I made it work in the first first month um, moving there. Good deal, man. And uh, who did you learn from? Land, uh, who did you, you learn the land flipping method from? Um, I joined a course, uh, but it didn't teach me the way I wanted to teach because uh, that I want to do because they teach me to buy a land and sell in terms. I was okay. like, why do I hustle for like $150 a month? You know, that was a very hard thing to do. So I changed the system a little bit and with the help of my, well, my military friend, uh, I just, um, make it, uh, make it work for for myself so i twist this system and um, i add something on my own and uh, luckily enough it works it works great good yeah. deal and um what was your first when did you start doing the land flipping Let, let's go let's let's go back to dates like when do you do that uh about 2019 okay, uh, so. southern the end of 2018 yeah about four years four or five years ago yeah and years, yeah. and how like what's the biggest check you collected in land flipping and what's the smallest check you collected in land flipping? Um I in my first year I made about three hundred thousand and uh, I guess uh the first deal was kind of big but there was a lot of smaller deals. So that was fifteen hundred profit each deal for about a hundred and fifty of them. But it's all from one seller. So he decided to sell his land uh, for all of them. I, I just bought all of them. Yeah. So that's kind of the big one. Good deal. But I know you made a lot of money in land. Like, you, you made some, some big checks. Like, 
what was was the was a big check on, on land flipping look like? Um, the check is about a hundred sixty thousand. The biggest and, one. Uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, the I paid sixty thousand for that land. So you uh, bought it for sixty, and you and you I guess you wholesaled it for one sixty or or two forty maybe. I bought it and sold it. So, so you in, closed on it. You bought the piece of land. Yeah, I bought it. So in land, it's more like bigger return percentage of ice. Uh, you know, it's not going to be like a million dollar check, right? Right. But the percentage of return is huge. So right now, average, I make about 100% return on each deal. Okay. Um, yeah. So the if you have... A lot of people, they start with very small deals. Let's say they only have $10,000. So you can make it to 100000 really quick if you do land flipping. But with houses, it will be a little bit hard, especially right now. The competition is, is huge. It's tougher, yes. Um, more people are focused on houses and, and multifamilies and things like that than they are in land because they don't understand the land business. You know, it, um, yeah. I made, I think the the smallest check I've ever made was from a land deal. It was 750 bucks for one piece <laughs> of land. Hey, and Ray, and that was a JV deal. So uh, so it was 1500 but each of us made 750 But what I tell people is I say, okay, look, you made $750 on one deal, but what if you can do that deal 50 times a month? Yeah, absolutely. Right? So I got a calculator here, like a, like a good investor. So if we do 50 deals times 750, that's 37,000. I mean, I, I don't know, but I could live very well with $37,000 a month on flipping little chunks of land. Absolutely. And uh, yeah. No, no, go ahead. Yeah, with land flipping, you can really start small. And especially people who own land, normally don't have emotional attached to it. So nope. they were willing to let it go very, very quick. They let it go very quick, easily. They, um, because their kids didn't grow up in there, they don't have a house that are, they're attached emotionally to. For them, it's actually a problem. They might be paying taxes on it. They're tired of paying taxes on it. Uh, they don't have the means to go and build on it, you know, or improve the land or do whatever. Um, so let's talk about that a little bit. Um, what are, I would say, and I'm not, I don't mean for you to disclose your whole uh, system because you have a, a, a course that where you explain all of that, but what are the, the like the, the five steps that one must do in order to, um, you know, to, to be a successful land flipper? Uh, in our system, we have six steps. The first step is uh, we have to find a market. Uh, the market got to be not in the major growing city like Dallas, Austin. That's too competitive, but about two or three hours away. And, uh, you know, we choose a county that has recently sold for more than 50, 60 sold for only land. So that's a good market. And then after we find a market, we just... Uh, uh, try to make offers in the entire county. So we send them direct mail out to all the landowners and with the offer price and they can call us back to either sell us the land or curse on us, right? So if they decide to sell it to us and then we negotiate again. So that's a step. But the third step is we uh, evaluate the land so that you know how to negotiate. So that's kind of like a preparation for negotiation. So after negotiation, you just have to close it and then we sell it by the realtor. So you don't need to worry about it. Uh, and uh, the process is very simple. Okay, so let me ask you a question. Can you do, why don't you, instead of buying the land, if you, like as I, I, you mentioned a couple of times that you buy the land, yeah. you close on it and then you resell it, right? Yep. Why not do an ovation on it if you're listing it with an agent? Innovation? Like a... An ovation. You can do an ovation. 
and you don't have to buy the land because, I, and we can talk about that offline. That, oh. that might be something you okay. may want to introduce to your. Okay, I, I know what you mean. So you put on the contract and list it with the agent right away. Right, away. right but you, you, you get you get the rights to list it. Like you got to do it all legally, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, you can do that, but some state is illegal. Okay. Yeah, right. some states don't allow that. And uh, if you happen to be in states that allow people to do that, meaning you put on a contract, you just uh, uh, sell the contract on the MLS if you can, that's that's good. That's wonderful. Good deal. And um, okay, so let so th those are the six steps that you have for land flipping, but. What does a good piece of land need to look like in order to for you to say, hmm, I want to buy that one? Like, what, what are you looking for in a piece of land? Um, I have a different view on that. Um, instead of pre-qualify or try to qualify the land, I tell people all the time, you are not the market. So, for example, if your land has a lot of trees or you will uh, wetland, landlocked, or even the land is not even flat. Uh, it's a slope land. So sometimes people think, oh, nobody will buy that. It's a slope land. It's not even flat. What can I build on it? But instead of thinking that, I tell people, uh, is, do you see any similar lots sold nearby? If there is, that means there are people buying those kind of land. And now you can use the exact problem to majority of the people. You can use that to negotiate with the seller. So you can get a deeper discount uh, because, you know, you, you just bring out the concern and maybe the seller will give you a deeper discount and now you have a good deal. Uh, instead of thinking, oh, that's a landlocked, nobody will buy a land with no, ac with no access. But, you know, if there's a similar law so nearby, I would buy it. I, d I don't care because there's proven concept, right? Got it. Got it. Yeah. And what kind of pieces of land do people need to stay away from, in your opinion? Um, I think, for example, if this, the land has those problems that we, we just mentioned, and if there's no similar loss so nearby, you might double think, uh, think about it. Uh, you might reconsider it, and uh, you, now you have only another option, which is just offer a price that you cannot lose or you can afford to lose. Uh, for example, I was buying a land in St. Lucie County. It's kind of in the middle of nowhere. And uh, I wasn't sure at all. So I bought it for two grand and uh, I can afford to lose that. Uh, at least I was mentally prepared. So uh, when I post it online and, uh, you know, on TikTok, uh, I do TikTok, right? So a lot of comments says, Oh, that's a wetland. Nobody will buy it. Uh, you know, I know the area. I live nearby. There's no way you can sell it. You know, those kind of comments. I said, you know, let's see, right? I post online. I sold it for t for ten thousand. Uh, you know, it just like if your land is you're not sure, there's no similar loss on nearby. You just buy a price that you, you, you can afford to lose. Yeah. Got it. Um, we I think we've done. Last year we might have done maybe five to ten land deals, and usually for us we're not targeting land because we're targeting houses. Yeah. But the owners of the houses happen to have land that they don't want anymore. And, yeah, all the time. And that's how we get to the land. Um, lately, I've been targeting land more actively because when I look back, those were the easiest deals that we we ever did because there were no emotions attached. Um, it's as simple as ordering a survey and, and, and we do it after we have a buyer. We don't, uh, like I'll give you an example. We did a piece of land in the middle of Texas. I, I don't remember the name of, of the town, but it was two one acre lots, one right next to each other. And the owner, the ARV, so the, the, the or the market value of the land was $70,000. Okay, that was the market value of the land. Like if you were to put it on the MLS, you can get as, mu as much as 70,000, right? We locked them up for $35,000 each. And what we did is we wholesaled it to 
two sisters that wanted to move each one of them in the one acre lot for fifty-five thousand dollars each. So, so we we made twenty thousand on the on each lot, but the the owner bought them because they they saw that they were getting a piece of land with equity on it. So they were getting a steal basically, and we were getting a steal from the seller. And that's what the seller wanted. When we asked, "Well, how much do you want?" He said, "I want thirty-five thousand dollars a piece." Done. Yeah. We send the contract. We sign it. And then we wholesale it to to the to the to the ladies that, that were two sisters, and I'm assuming they're building a house now. Um, yeah. And then that's what I like about land is there's no emotion. So you gotta do is get a survey, and you get the right size of the 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 the, uh, the lot. But have you ever encountered a piece of land that has something weird on the survey or something weird where people couldn't buy it or something along those lines. Uh, I never encounter land that I cannot sell. You know, people buy weird land all the time. Uh, but if the land has like a drainage crossing the land, uh, that might be hard to sell. Uh, if the land has um, easement agreement with someone else, that might be harder to sell. So just be careful of those. You have to know that before you buy it, and then you can make the right judgment. We had a piece of land in South, I think it was North Carolina or South Carolina that was next to a house, okay? And it was a good size. It was like it was like a quarter of an acre or something like that. Mm. And we put it on their contract. We found a buyer. The buyer put their earnest money and he went to the city and asked we had a survey so everything was good and we went to this he went to the city and the city says you cannot build on that lot oh uh, why I, I i have to look up my, my emails but um, <laughs> they would not allow him to build on the lot so unfortunately that was a piece of land we had to cancel the contract and refund the earnest money uh, i couldn't even believe it i, I think i would have bought it without even seeing it because there was nothing saying that you couldn't build on the lot, but that was a piece of land that, that, that had a problem and, and uh, we refunded the earnest money and the set, the, the buyer was, but that's a buyer that knew how to do his due diligence. He went to the, the city and, and said, Hey, I'm planning on building a house there. And the city said, no, you cannot build a house in there because I guess the, the property, the, the, the land was like at the end of the street and, it was like the last corner lot, and for some reason it was condemned. I, I don't remember why. Even the city couldn't tell us why. But it's like that piece of land you cannot build on. So, um, yeah. And we went to the seller and we said, look, if you fix this and you remove that, then we can buy the land. But we never heard back from the person. So um, yeah. that's an unfortunate one of a million situation, right? Yeah. So you gotta be careful of that, and uh, uh, you know, even on buildable land, people still buy. You just have to find the right buyer, and of course, you have to negotiate with the seller for a much deeper discount. Of course, yeah, and we had it at a good, like we got it at a good price. But once we found out we had the challenge, the buyer, he was gonna build a house, so he did, he said, you know, I can't, I'm not gonna touch it. And because maybe somebody else will buy it and go fix the problem with the city. But in this case, you know, it, it, that was not the, and the seller didn't want to discount it either. So he's like, no, I'll go figure it out and we'll talk later. So now let's talk about, you, you said earlier that you do um, self, you know, self-development, right? Like you, you read audiobook, you listen to audiobooks and you read books and things like that. What do you think are the, 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 the things that have helped you the most becoming a successful entrepreneur? I think is um, one thing I tell people all the time is we have three kind of people. The first kind of people is a complainer. Uh, they always complain someone else, the government, why my dad wasn't rich. If he is rich, I don't have to work, right? But uh, those kind of people always blame someone else but them, themselves. Uh, but you know, we don't want to be them. We don't even want them to be around us. 
um, you know, otherwise you, you will be influenced for sure. Uh, that's the first kind of people. And second kind of people is they're kind of comfortable, right? So they have their own cars, house. They think they made it. They don't have any other desire. They're like, you know, I, I, I'm comfy. You know, I don't need anything else. So those kind of people are kind of grateful for what they have, but they're not going to go after something after the dream. They kind of live a common life, right? But the, the, the third kind of people is what I always try to achieve, which is very, very hard. Um, they, this, this kind of people is a, the rich people, uh, not only in materials, but in their mind. What I mean is, if you look at Steve, Steve Jobs or Henry Ford, they all, they all have one thing in common, which is they can be able to see the, see the future in their mind and they can grab the future to the present and act as if that pres that future is already achieved. So, for example, when Steve Jobs created iPhone, he didn't ha tell his team, hey, go ahead and create a, a phone that better than Blueberry. I don't care what it is, just create it, right? He didn't say that. He said, I need a phone that only have one button and that one button, one button can control everything else. And uh, everything else should be a screen. So he went to the future somehow and he grabbed the future to the present day and he acts as if it's already accomplished right so that's the ability that the rich people have uh, for example when you don't have money and uh, imagine you are earning a million dollar a year is extremely hard but once you have that ability and act as if you already achieve it you will be unlimited you know, you'll be limitless. That's the word, right words, right? So, uh, Henry Ford is the same thing. When he created the eight-cylinder engine, and not, nobody believed him, you know, not even his experts. But he said, go create it anyways. So, eventually, they created, right? Yeah, no, no big uh, achievement came from trying to stay small or complacent, right? It, it, it was always somebody seeking for more and more and more and more and 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 dreaming that it could be done but you're right like before things materialize you have to feel it like if it's already there otherwise it's not going to happen uh you know that's the law of attraction basically you you have to be able to feel it with you within you and and that's how you're going to vibrate in the same frequency as all those things that you want to attract in life. Um, yeah. yeah. What, what's the most important is that your action. And, uh, but majority of people don't take the action unless they feel that's possible. So you won't take actions if you don't think it's possible. So if you think it's possible and now you take a lot of actions and uh, now you have results, right? So it's all start with what do you think? What does a, a day look like in your life, right? Like, what do you, what are, like, from whenever you wake up to whenever you go to bed, what does it, what, what's a normal day on Ray's life? Uh, I guess, um, I don't know, it's kind of, I, I don't know, it's, it's from nature or from my childhood. Uh, I always feel like today I got to do something that matters, right? Um, no matter what achievement I had in the last week. So every single week, I see this, the entire week as a challenge. Uh, as far as the numbers goes, as far as how many books I read, uh, as far as how many people I have talked to. So uh, I always try to talk to more people, you know, uh, on the land flipping business, on the coaching business. Uh, also, I try to read more. There's so many books I can read. Even I'm um, in China, I bought so many books and, and read them. So I guess uh, a lot of people are born that way. But if if you're born like kind of laid back, you can still uh, have a goal that you think is worthwhile. And then when you try to achieve it, you will feel motivated to do the actions. That's good. We're going to say hi to Joanna Sanchez, who's uh, listening and watching right now. She's a friend from Houston, Texas. 
We have people from Louisville, Kentucky connected. Uh, Caesar is, is online. He said, uh, I had in the past, in the near past, a piece of land with 10 acres. Um, I'm pretty sure he was talking about having it under contract or something along those lines. Yeah, um, sell it to me. Sell it to you, right? Hey, why not? <laughs> like, we'll, we'll send it to you if it's a good deal you buy. Um, it's, yeah. it's pretty much... Now, do you buy from wholesalers? Uh, I try not to, but if it does a good deal, yes. Why not? You know, I bought houses from wholesalers before, and I'm a wholesaler myself. But if I get a good deal, I'm like, you know what? This is too good yeah. to pass. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go take on it. Yeah, because uh, I, oh, I guess that's a problem myself, which is I, I always believe when I negotiate, I can get a much deeper discount. Um, but when the wholesaler try to sell it, they already add their fee is not going to be, you know, what I'm looking for. But, you know, if the deal makes sense, uh, I will still buy it. That's the Chinese in you, man. Trying to hustle every <laughs> penny you can, right? So it's normal. I, like people that are in business, they, they, we know that we can get deeper and deeper and deeper. And, and, and every penny counts, basically, when, when you're negotiating. I like to think about it as a win, win, win. So if I can... If I can win, the seller can win, my buyers can win, everybody wins, then it's, go, it's gonna be a good business practice that everybody wins. And, and I don't like it when I buy a property and the person that I bought the property from feels like we stole it because they're gonna have some resentment and things of that nature towards you. So we always try to do the best we can for the seller. Uh, we do the best we can for us as well because we're we're on the on, on you know we're in it to make money. We're not we're not in it for charitable you know reasons. Um, that's what a business is supposed to be like. I asked my team today that question. It's like, what is the purpose of this company? And I heard multiple answers until one guy got up and said the purpose of this company is to be profitable and make money. And I said, bingo, you got it. That's what we're in business for. Um, and, and it's very important that people understand that and, and have that present because otherwise their efforts are going to get sidetracked and, and, and go somewhere else where they're not supposed to. So, um, yeah. so you read, you do a lot of self-development, you do a lot of, uh, you're on a mastermind with me in the family mastermind. That's where we met. Um, yeah. what do you think of masterminds? Like what, what, uh, what's your opinion on, on mentoring, coaching, mastermind, things of that nature? Uh, I think it will save you years of self imploring you know, if you try to do it yourself. A lot of time people think, oh, I save a lot of money, just go to YouTube and watch the free stuff and I can be able to do it myself. So what they don't notice is the free stuff is normally the most expensive one uh, to, to go through. So it's always like that. So let's say you pay a guy 10,000 to teach you how to do something. And he tell you to do it, and uh, now you have the confidence because he tells you, right? And he has done it, and you just follow him. That's it. But if you do it yourself, and then you go to YouTube, and all these people are talking about different stuff, and then you'll be like, okay, who should I listen to? Or maybe I try this this guy. And then when things get hard, and it will, and you start to doubt him, you start to doubt the first guy, and then you you think maybe the second guy has a better solution. Let me go go to follow him for a second, and you follow him for a second, and now things get hard. It doesn't work for you. You go to the third guy. Now you waste time, waste money, and uh, just not worth it at all. Free stuff is always expensive, most expensive, most expensive. How does your team look like today? Uh, I have one VA. That's about it. <laughs> That's about it. So you do yeah. you do all the negotiations? I do, yeah. So you're still very much in your business. Like you you pick up the phone, you make the phone calls, you talk to the owners, make the offers and the contracts, all of that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I should hire an acquisition manager and teach teach him how to negotiate. But I do enjoy the process and uh, sometimes uh, all entrepreneur has the problem. They think they are the hero. You know, I'm the hero. Nobody else can do it better than me. My side, right. which is which is totally not true. <laughs> but, right. Uh, yeah. 
So, but, but you know, land flipping business is, is extremely easy as far as the process, uh, the things that you have to do. You know, I, I, I got nothing else to do, right? So I got to just talk to them. How many deals on average do you do a year? Uh, about 30 to 50. And what's the average profit per deal? Uh, right now, I try to raise it. Uh, it used to be 10,000. Right now, I try to do at least 20 or 30. And uh, last year, we did pretty well. And uh, this year, um, it's, it's OK. But uh, uh, I just have to mail more right now. So you, you basically focus on direct mail? I only do direct mail with the offer price. What about? Call, calling, texting. Why not? You know, do those. Yeah, I hate call calling. I think it's a waste of time. Uh, yeah. You know, call calling is is uh, is 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 a method that you turn you to cold, right? So you got a lot of rejections, no deals, and uh, the process is extremely not fun. Uh, as far as testing is a highly regulated uh, activity. So, but no matter what you do, there are people with success at uh, cold calling like Brand Daniels, right? So if you choose that method, just stick on this one, right? Don't, don't change around. Don't say I will do direct mail a little bit. I do cold calling a little bit and see what works. No, it doesn't work that way. So just choose one. And then if that's, that's the way you want to go, just stick with it. Yeah, we do a lot of cold calling, a lot of a lot of texting. For us, it works. We get deals, leads yeah. every day, and uh, we also get deals all the time from cold calling and texting. That's why I ask, and because I used to do mailers before, like in two thousand, I think we stopped doing mailers before the pandemic, uh, before the lockdown, and. In two thousand seventeen, I used to send eighty thousand pieces of mail per month. So, oh, wow. yeah, because we were doing that as uh, real estate at a, at a large scale, right? So our marketing budget, even though we produce our own letters, because we had all we have a we had a company called Direct Mail Out, basically, we sold you know letters, postcards, and all that. Um, at the time, the cost of printing a yellow letter was like with everything, the stamp and all that was probably like fifty-five cents, maybe, for the postcard yeah. or less. Uh, but that's why we were fully integrated. We we brought it all in house to control the cost and and mail quicker. Okay. Um, once I discovered data and cold calling and texting, I said, "Man, there's no way I can do letters ever again because it, it cost me eight cents per skip trace or a record, and then the text message is one and a half cents going out in and out. You go from fifty five cents to 15 cents, if that, you know, per record. Mm. And and you get to talk to the people quicker because the, the mailing route is more, you send the letters and then they start calling back and it's more of a reaction thing. Um, we we went from contracting, I don't know, houses, three months, you know, three weeks to a month into a couple of weeks only because now we, we're talking to the people quicker. So maybe something for you to explore if, I know cold calling is hard. I, you know, I, I, we have cold callers, and we actually have a, a company called Top of the Line VA where we provide uh, cold callers and texters. I still don't know how the hell they do it because they get on the computer all day long and they're dialing and dialing and dialing and dialing. I mean, we, we pay them well for that, but it's a, uh, it's a very, it's a very demanding job, you know, and and yeah, and I think my use of my time is better doing something else. I agree with you. It's 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 brutal. Yeah, it's work. all good as as long as uh, it's all good as long as you don't do it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's, I like to outsource all that stuff, right? And 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 yeah. and hire it, and, and we train people, and we're hiring every day now uh, for for those jobs, and and eventually. So what the way we do it now, Ray, is that they come in as a call caller, then they graduate into a lead manager, and then from a lead manager they graduate into a closer, and. Mm. We actually have a lot of investors that use our services that have lead managers, call callers, and closers working on their team. They're not negotiating anymore. They train the people on how to do it, and, and, and it's, it's successful. So 
But uh, anyhow, guys, I want to invite you October 27th and 28th in Orlando, Florida to Pearls of Real Estate, which is an event where we're going to have two to 300 people showing up. We're going to have amazing speakers. I'm not sure if Ray is going to be in the U.S. to attend during that time, uh, but go to prosofrealestate.com and get your tickets. They're going up in price September 1st. Right now it's August 30th. We raise the prices and the closer you get to the event, the more expensive it is to attend. So check out the website, Pros of Real Estate. I'd like to see you there. It's in Orlando, Florida, October 27th, 28th, two full days. A bunch of great speakers, a bunch of great people attending. Um, and we're gonna have a great time. Ray, brother, thank you so much for jumping in with us, for, for sharing your journey from janitor all the way to multi-million dollar real estate investor. Uh, I admire what you've done. It's it's um, it's remarkable. You came to this country or to the U.S. 13 years ago, and and now you're teaching many. How can people get a hold of you? Like, how can people know more about Ray? How can they buy your course? Where do they go? Uh, just add my Instagram, uh, Virtual Flipland. That's one word, Virtual Flipland. Virtual Flipland at Virtual Flipland. Send a DM, say, hey, I'm interested in learning how to flip land. Ray is going to teach, show you the ways. He's going to teach you the secrets that he has. Uh, and he's done. How many students have you helped out so far, Ray? Uh, right now I have uh, over 100 students. Um, wow. Yeah, I don't know the number, but, you know, if you follow the process, I'm sure they will uh, make some deals. I already have uh, people make a lot of money for example we all know zach booth and he's a house guy too and he has been making a lot of money on land already okay yeah good shout out to him awesome brother well thank you so much for being here today guys and i'll see you on the next one thank you ricardo no no problem just stay online right